good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Sleep Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today we have Dr. Krishnan from uh, Metro Health uh, Hospitals in uh, Case, as uh, most people here will know, uh, who's going to be presenting uh, to us. She's uh, planning on presenting for, for, for chest uh, next week, and uh, she's going to be reviewing a series of uh, high-impact articles in uh, sleep medicine over the last few years. Cool. Thanks, Sushil. So, yeah, um, like you said, I next week I'm um, giving the talk for chest on um, high impact articles, specifically on sleep disordered breathing. So this won't cover any non sleep disorder breathing. It won't cover pediatrics. Uh, so those two are covered by other speakers. So I was asked to choose um, five articles. Uh, four to five articles that I thought were um, of interest to clinicians, both uh, sleep medicine and non-sleep medicine people. So this review um, will be fairly um, high level in terms of uh, the details of these articles, but I'll certainly stop after each one and we can discuss a little bit more. Um, I sort of have four and a half articles as, as you'll see at the end. Um, and then I have two runners up. If there's time, we can talk about them. And um, I would also love your input as to um, the articles that I chose. So <clears throat> that's me. I have nothing to disclose. Um, the objectives, as I mentioned, was to summarize these five articles, appraise the literature, and maybe integrate them into our clinical practice. Um, so it was really hard for me to start this kind of talk without mentioning something about COVID, especially with the last couple of years. So the first article I wanted to review was this uh, one by Strauss and colleagues from the BMJ Open Respiratory Research on sleep apnea as a risk factor for severe COVID-19. Um, as background, we all know that obstructive sleep apnea and severe COVID-19 are both associated with um, common risk factors like obesity, diabetes, older age, uh, male sex, and chronic cardiopulmonary disease. So this study, um, had objectives to determine whether obstructive sleep apnea represents an independent risk factor for developing uh, severe COVID-19 as required by requiring hospitalization, and also whether uh, it was a risk factor for contracting COVID-19 in the first place in patients uh, with obstructive sleep apnea. The study was performed in Finland and pooled data was collected from multiple large data sets, including the FinGen, which is a large biobank study that aimed to genotype 500,000 Finnish people, the National Hospital Discharge Registry, Causes of Death Registry, National Infectious Disease Registry, the Medication Reimbursement Registry, as well as local records from the Heart and Lung Center, um, the Department of Oral Face of Maxillofacial Diseases at Helsinki University Hospital um, in terms of obstructive sleep apnea treatment information. The study uh, found 260,000 Finnish people who were included in the study. 445 of these patients were identified as uh, contracting COVID-19. That was eight and a half percent of patients who had obstructive sleep apnea and 8% of the total population in the FinGen database. So they were relatively similar, those who contracted uh, COVID-19 with and without obstructive sleep apnea. And of those, 91 patients with COVID-19 required hospitalization. 21% of them have obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and of those patients, when um, regression analyses were uh, performed to look at risk factors for hospitalization, obstructive sleep apnea maintained a significant odds ratio with multiple different regression models. The first model adjusted for age and sex, the second also included 
Body mass index, the third model, also included hypertension, diabetes, asthma, COPD, and coronary disease. So adjusting for all of these risk factors, obstructive sleep apnea remained an independent risk factor for severe COVID-19. The limitations for the study was that it used registry data. So there's obviously a misclassification uh, potential, particularly false negative cases. The FinGen data had a mean age of about 58.6 years, which is older than the total Finnish population. Um, and Finland in general, as you saw, had a much lower rate of COVID-19 cases in the first wave compared to other countries. So the takeaway points for this first case is that obstructive sleep apnea was not associated with increased risk of contracting COVID-19, but it was associated with a higher risk of being hospitalized, even after adjusting for age, sex, BMI, um, and comorbidities. So I will pause and see if anybody has any comments on the first case. Did, was the uh, multiple regression done on the 400? 45 patients that had it? Was that when you showed the, and then when they did all the models, it was only uh, 0.045 p-value? That's close. Isn't Correct. Okay. You, yes. think it's a big, you think it's a big enough, yeah. big enough study to capture that particular issue? Because I think there's some other people that have come up with larger data sets that have kind of whiffed on this issue. I chose this one because it really seemed it was the largest one I could find that was published um, that also had used, you know, four database studies. This was a pretty robust study. Right. Um, but it's large because it's 260, but it's not large because it's 445. Correct. Um, but the data itself uh, was the most reliable that I could find. That's, that was my only question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know this. This is sort of so hard because I think the big issue is just, um, you know, whether there's issues of residual confounding. You know what? It, well, you know, it, it also just raises the question of what, what is it about obstructive sleep apnea? Is it truly causal, or is there just something about the type of person that happens to have obstructive sleep apnea that just increases their their risk? of developing a, a COVID. You know, the other thing I think that would be interesting, and I guess you don't, you would, you know, they, they wouldn't have access to it, but would have been, you know, what was the effect of treatment status, you know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we don't know if, if that made any difference here at all or not. Which they said they um, accessed local records, but really didn't make much mention in the paper itself. And exactly, and I did think that, you know, that last model, um, May have been over adjusted as well too, um, you know, um, because age, sex, BMI are so strongly associated with obstructive sleep apnea. There may have been some over adjustment um, with um, using those as confounders. I'm going to bring up one more thing that you, yeah, that to be in my bonnet these days. The, the people are well treated for sleep apnea with, with CPAP. Use it more than 70% of the time. Have an AHI below five. Do they now have sleep apnea? And so I wonder what the treatment status was of these people. Because we always, because the discussion will always say intermittent hypoxemia, arousals from sleep, poor this, poor that. But if you're really well treated for, I don't know, we have people now treated for 20 years. Do they really have, you know, everybody kind of points. To, I think it's an underlying health. It's a, it's a traveler with other things That's at that point. Agreed. Um, definitely the, uh, a direction I'd like to see. Yes. Hey, Sally. Hey, how are you? Good. Um, so uh, the one big takeaway is it's a very large 260,000 is that sleep apnea doesn't necessarily provoke ha get contracting COVID-19 in that for that very first aim. Correct. So that's interesting. But in this smaller sample, when you do have COVID-19 and sleep apnea, your outcome is hospitalization. That's sort of 
Is there, did the authors talk about why that might be or what the mechanisms might be? Um, in, I don't recall specifically. I, um, I would surmise, um, like yeah. Kingman was saying, that it might have to do with uh, intermittent hypoxia and uh, maybe disturbed sleep sure. having some effect on the immune system as well. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Interesting study. Yeah. Okay. Interesting study number two. Um, and this will, I acknowledge that this will go a little fast. So the discussion is very helpful as well because the whole talk is only meant to be about 20, 25 minutes. Um, so the second article that I chose was this randomized controlled clinical trial exploring the safety and tolerability of sulfine in sleep apnea. And this was conducted in Sweden uh, by Hedner et al. I believe it's Sweden. So um, obstructive sleep apnea therapies, um, as we know, is primarily limited to devices and surgeries, but our patients are always asking for that um, you know, golden treatment of uh, a medication. Pharmaceutical therapy interventions um, may be therapeutic for obstructive sleep apnea, in particular, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide have been studied, as well as these combinations of noradrenergic and anti-muscarinic drug combinations. Um, so this study looked to explore the safety and tolerability of carbonic anhydrase inhibitor sulfiame in obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so sulfiame was chosen because it's already um, approved in Sweden for as second line treatment for um, benign childhood uh, epilepsy with um, central temporal uh, spikes. Um, this study was a four week double blind randomized placebo controlled dose guided trial um, for patients with moderate to severe sleep apnea who were not tolerating positive airway pressure. They started with a dose of 200 milligrams of sulfiame and planned to ramp up the dose up to 1,000 milligrams, but their data safety monitoring board actually recommended stopping at a dose of 400 milligrams due to some side effects that we'll talk about. This was a four-week treatment plan, which uh, was one of the longest pharmaceutical uh, pharmacotherapeutic trials for obstructive sleep apnea. The major inclusion exclusion criteria, inclusion included age of 18 to 75 years old, a BMI of 20 to 35, and an upward sleepiness score of at least six. And they excluded patients with primarily central sleep apnea, other sleep disorders that were diagnosed already, like periodic limb movement disorder, parasomnias, significant nocturnal hypoxemia, and uncontrolled hypertension. <clears throat> In table one of the study, the demographics indicate um, that years old um, in both the placebo and treatment groups, the gender, uh, the sex was primarily male in both the treated and non-treated groups, but slightly more in the placebo group. Um, there were more current and previous smokers in the treatment group compared to placebo. Body mass index was generally in the overweight but not obese category on average. And heart rate by design, uh, I'm sorry, blood pressure by design was relatively well controlled in the 130s over 80s. The most common adverse reactions were paresthesias um, in the sulfine group, 76% versus 18%, headaches and dyspnea. Um, and these adverse reactions did increase with increasing dose, which was why the 400 milligram was the maximum dose that was recommended by the DSMB for this study. Um, but what was interesting is that the apnea hypopnea index at baseline was uh, in the severe range at baseline, 
54 on average for the placebo group, 55 to 60 in the treated group. And after four weeks, there was a reduction in the HI by about three in the placebo group, but by uh, about 20 in the treated group with a significant p-value for that change in uh, apnea hypopnea index after four weeks of treatment. There were other significant findings, including a reduction in the apnea index, hypopnea index, the central apnea index, REM AHI, non-REM AHI, the duration of each respiratory event, the uh, oxygen desaturation index, and the mean O2 saturation. Uh, of interest, there was no significant change in the APWAR sleepiness score, nor in the sleep architecture parameters. Um, so the study was restricted um, in its study population in that uh, it uh, excluded patients who uh, did tolerate positive airway pressure uh, or did not include them. The APWAR sleepiness score had to be at least six there was well-controlled hypertension in this group. So it limits the generalizability of the study results to our population. Um, and it might be a limitation that the study period was only four weeks with at least two weeks on the final dose of treatment. But I also saw it as a takeaway point that this was one of the longest duration pharmacotherapeutic studies for obstructive sleep apnea that showed positive results in the therapy, and that sulfiame, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, may be a viable pharmacotherapy for obstructive sleep apnea. Thoughts about that one? Mm. That's really interesting. You know, um, there was a study a few years ago looking at um, zanisamide, another anticonvulsant, uh, that also has carbonic anhydrase inhibition um, qualities, and it had, if I'm recalling correctly, fairly similar results, a uh, little bit of a shorter study, but this was independent of the weight loss that you can sometimes see. Um, I don't know. So there's, it seems to be that there's something here mechanistically. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that they uh, excluded central sleep apnea. That's kind of always been our presumed mechanism of action, right? You sort of reduce loop gain, stabilize respiratory physiology. Maybe there's some of that um, going on here, but I, I don't know that in my brain it makes sense that this would be a mechanism that's uh, that has a treatment effect. But um, here we are a few studies in, and it seems to be real. That's really interesting. Well, I think it 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 shows, you know, there have been there have been physiologic studies that show that you know the importance of of loop gain is not just to central sleep apnea, but it's it is also important to obstructive sleep apnea, you know, with the four compartment model that's been 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 proposed. So, so, you know, I will say that sometimes I've I've done this with some of my patients on 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 CPAP, and it's it's. It's impressive, but you know, I usually see about a third to fifty percent reduction. You know, now whether I get a clinical improvement in terms of symptoms is a is another thing. So that's why I'm kind of curious here, Vidya. Did they comment? Uh, you know, I didn't see. Uh, uh, did they comment on any sort of patient oriented outcomes in terms of quality of life or or you know sleepiness or things like that? The Epworth sleepiness score was the only thing they did comment on, and they found no significant change in treatment versus placebo group. So, Vidya, if you were going to pick a dose at a time, what would you do from this study? Probably the 200 milligram dose, I think, um, just yeah. based on the, the adverse events. Um, and, and the, and the, uh, the paresthesia uh, seemed very did, common in these patients. Did they, did they uh, do any sort of examples of individuals like show changes? So, I mean, what you would expect if it was loop gain is some people will have a really good effect and some people will not have much at all. And yes. that's sort of seen in the acetazolamide studies from Boston. That's seen in some of the buspirone studies from other people. And this 20% effect is sort of like what people have shown before. Exactly. And, yeah. So there exactly. might be people that do that. And then the other is, remember, a P crit, if it goes up above three, you're going to have obstructive apneas. And then three to 60 is probably looking. 
So these guys up there, 53, have a lot of loop gain uh, or, or muscle uh, recruitment. I mean, they're all asleep, so it's not it's not the sleep pathway here, Sushil. <laughs> right. Well, if yeah, if their yeah. upper airway is you know so vulnerable, then it doesn't matter how often they. Right. But right. they're the anatomy. Yeah, the anatomy. Right. The anatomy. The anatomy. The anatomy. I don't think it changes the anatomy. That's that's the major. I don't think it changes. The anatomy. Yeah, I think sort of the bigger question yeah. is this sort of continues to pan out, like. Yeah. Why, yeah. why would you use this as opposed to uh, acetazolamide, which is probably a lot cheaper? <laughs> or clopper. I mean, this is a form that so this, you just this sip this with water. Yeah. Um, so here's the individual data. I hope right. you can see that. It's sort of small, but most patients right. did show a significant yeah. improvement. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I think 200. See, I, you know, I, I've got some other ways of thinking about how to do drug studies. Because these are all preliminary studies yeah. that we should just be trying to figure out whether or not they do anything. Yeah, I think yeah, I think probably the next set of studies really have to include patient-oriented outcomes. That's that's the key thing. Yeah, because if if patients aren't feeling better from a sleep apnea perspective, but have headache and paresthesias, I mean, are we just giving them side effects and treating a number to make us happy? Oh, so that's that's a, in medicine. <laughs> Just kidding. So, Shiel, do you see, you Shiel, do you see like, that level of paresthesia when, when you give it? Have you seen that? Those no, complaints you know, of paresthesia? I'm surprised by at least, yeah, with acetazolamide, I am, you know, everybody sort of starts, you know, getting nervous and about side effects and whatnot. But what I am what I am uh, consistently impressed by is the lack of side effects. So when you're talking with acetazolamide, when you're using doses of 250 to 500 milligrams, which is most of the time what you need, you know, it's not a problem. It's, it's really what you start talking about people, you know, that have other reasons to be on higher doses, you know, like John, John will know those patients, you know, uh, both the Johns, uh, uh, but, you know, those patients that have increased ICP for one reason or another, those are the ones that you're on 1500, 2000 milligrams, and those are the ones that have the side effects. Does anyone know about long-term yeah, the glaucoma, studies? The glaucoma uh, literature on acetazolamide, they don't, they don't report this kind of side effects either. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Vidya and others, I wonder what about long term? And we know sleep apnea is a chronic disease, right? So if you put a drug and you're happy with the AHI, well, what happens a year later? Do you continue the medication? Those are always my questions with these medications. Yeah, they agreed. And I don't, I haven't seen any of these long term studies yet. Sure. Mm -hmm. No studies I'm aware of, but just anecdotally, right? Just from Kate, you know, from my own personal experience, I, it, it, it seems to be consistent. So I'm just wondering how, how many pe how many people have have put sleep apnics that can't tolerate CPAP on this? I'm just curious. Oh, I don't know for central sleep apnea. But I put it on people that are on CPAP that sleep apnics. I put that on regular. I guess I'm still waiting for the long term studies because that's the, what the patient will ask, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the glaucoma people use, have used this for years. The, the problem is acetazolamide and carbonic anhydrase is not very specific. There are probably 18 different imidazole uh, moieties uh, that this thing hits. And maybe this Kepra or this one hits something specific. And so you don't know where it is. The other thing I realized recently is that carbonic anhydrase and uh, acetazolamide itself even though the half-life, if you eject it in humans, is about 30 minutes, it, it gets sequestered in red blood cells uh, for 24 hours, and then it gets released. So it can go to a lot of different places. Yeah. And acutely, it does carotid body, it kind of does, uh, it changes responsiveness and things of that sort. So it's probably a pretty interesting drug. It's just that it's it's off-label, and it's, you know, this, this company that, Making this is sort of sitting there and jumping up and down, saying it's going to, you know, bump its stock market for a couple of points because of this. the the other issue. I think we have a we struggle in the adult population probably in terms of maybe thinking about using this as an adjunct at least is um, 
you know, you, you do have to be careful in patients that have, you know, car, you know, heart failure, you know, have chronic kidney disease, you know, and in that type of setting, you know, when you're talking with your colleagues, they're a lot, they're a lot more nervous. And I, but I, I, I often find, I think a lot of it is, I think a little bit due to just inexperience and just, you know, being taught the textbook, you know, concerns uh, about uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the effects in terms of uh, inducing a, a metabolic acidosis in their mind is a bad thing, but, um, you know, I'm not sure that's always the case. Yeah, you measure your you you measure your electrolytes and so I, on one out of about thirty occasions I was just shocked. The first one asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. The electrolytes were really yeah. crazy. So yeah, stopped. especially potassium issues. Yeah. The next study I chose, um, I wanted to delve into the cardiovascular implications of uh, sleep disordered breathing. I was really hoping that the ADVENT HF uh, results would be published by now, but they aren't um, as far as I know. So the I chose uh, this article um, on the effect of CPAP therapy on recurrence of atrial fibrillation after pulmonary vein isolation in patients with obstructive sleep apnea mostly because it was a, a robust randomized controlled trial. Um, it was part of the AFib apnea and airway pressure, the A3 study that was reported in Heart and Rhythm by Hunt and colleagues. Um, so the presence and severity of obstructive sleep apnea is associated with atrial fibrillation, but with advancements in AFib therapy, including pulmonary vein isolation, catheter ablation, um, the atrial fibrillation patients do have improved outcomes of atrial fibrillation. So uh, it led to this question of what is the role of obstructive sleep apnea in these patients with advanced treatment for their AFib. So the study objectives was to assess the effect of treatment of CPAP on the burden and recurrence of atrial fibrillation after PVI in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, um, and also to evaluate the effect of CPAP on quality of life. So some patient related outcomes here after PVI. The study design was randomized, controlled, open label, parallel group trial um, in two centers, uh, the study was conducted in Norway. They used implantable loop recorders to monitor the heart rhythms for the five months prior to PVI and the 12 months after PVI to report atrial fibrillation um, occurrence and recurrence. The inclusion criteria included uh, AHI of greater than 15 by a limited channel sleep study, um, and also they needed to tolerate CPAP for at least one week during the washout period and a diagnosis of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And the excluded patients with pre-existing obstructive sleep apnea that was known prior to the limited channel study, class three obesity, um, transient ischemic events, coronary artery disease, systolic heart failure, and an upper sleepiness scale of greater than 15. Uh, this was open label and uh, uh, there was no sham PAP therapy used in the control part, which is uh, controversial whether it should be or not. And the primary outcome was atrial fibrillation recurrence, which was defined as least two minutes of atrial fibrillation on the recorder. <clears throat> the results of the study um, were pretty neutral. So in patients who with obstructive sleep apnea who were treated with CPAP versus obstructive sleep apnea who received standard care, meaning apparently no CPAP, um, and then the non-obstructive sleep apnea at all. Uh, in the Kaplan-Meier curve, looking at the survival-free time from atrial fibrillation, over a 12 month period, there was no significant difference between these three uh, groups of patients. Uh, some of the limitations for this study was that it did require patients to tolerate CPAP within that first one week trial period, which uh, doesn't necessarily generalize to our patient population. 
they were powered to detect a 50% reduction in, a, in uh, atrial fibrillation recurrence, which was a large reduction and possibly um, one of the barriers to finding a significant difference between the groups. This study was primarily, it was done in Norway, so it was primarily male and white Northern Europeans who were included in the study. And there was uh, a lack of blinding to therapy, although they did use an objective way of measuring recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Um, so yeah, this my takeaway here is that um, although obstructive sleep apnea is associated with atrial fibrillation, this study didn't show a definitive reduction in atrial fibrillation recurrence after PVI. And this is limited to the patient population who underwent advanced therapy for atrial fibrillation, and was also looking for a pretty large reduction in atrial fibrillation. So perhaps a study that was powered to find a smaller reduction in AFib um, may be more expensive to conduct, but may also have some clinical relevance. So thoughts on this one um, and whether you think there were other significant studies in the last year? So, so a couple. So I have, a, I have, a, I've got a couple questions. One, what would be, what would, because we see this with drugs a lot. What would, what would everyone consider a significant reduction in AFib? That's one question. Two, you know, this is this is sort of controversial. It's the same thing with stroke. You know, is there? Do we have something in sleep medicine? Do we have a therapy to offer for AFib? That's sort of the that's sort of the big question. And I, I get this all the time. Some primary care doctors are like, no, nah, it, it's not going to help. And cardiology sends me a ton of patients that have AFib. So I'm not, you know, where is the where is the sweet spot? And is there a sweet spot? Is it, you know, that's that's my question. There's two questions. Yeah, I, we have so much data that <clears throat> of the association of sleep disorder breathing with cardiovascular um, complications, and yet these treatment studies were waiting for that. This, study this is show. like the third study to be done at this point. You know, the first study was attempted at the Mayo Clinic, and they had to end the study early because they were not in equipoise uh, as an institution. They were having a hard time recruiting for the study uh, because all the cardiologists believed so strongly that <coughs> sleep apnea. Um, so that, you know, there's an initial report from that, you know, then, you know, there was the A3 study that was published in the Blue Journal, uh, I think a, a year or two ago at this point. Um, I forget Maybe I, I can't remember if there was a difference in the patient populations because some of this is like, you know, what what's what's the sweet spot in terms of treating sleep apnea in patients uh, that have atrial fibrillation? Is it when they have very minimal atrial fibrillation? Is it you know where, when they have paroxysmal changes? You know, what's the effect when they have sort of more long-standing atrial fibrillation? You know, so I think these, at least these two different studies might try to address two different populations a little bit in terms of trying to answer this question with an RCT. And, you know, I don't, I don't fault them for trying 50% because the Mayo Clinic said that if you treated them, they had a 40% re re uh, recurrence. And if you didn't treat them, it was an 80% recurrence. But that was all retrospective in, in, in Mayo Clinic. And so, you know, if you look back and sort of said, what should I do? I think that 50% is probably, the, but I, I, I agree that I've got to be able to throw these back to the cardiologist. Here's a paper. What do you think? Yep. Yeah, it'd be great to get the, the EP guys and talk about so, it. So it's really a question of, should you take asymptomatic atrial fibrillation patients with an AHI of eight and subject them to therapy with CPAP? Which is what the cardiologists expect us to do. Yeah. I'll, I'll, right. I mean, if you look at the, what, if you go back to your uh, characteristics uh, slide on this, what, what was the severity of sleep apnea in this study? Uh, <coughs> so here's the moderate. table one here. Um, 
What was the mean? Yeah. So yeah. The mean age I was 21 yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in all three in the groups yeah. between the CPAP and the standard care group. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's HST. Was. Right. So it's probably underestimated a little bit, you know, but, yeah. um, but Kingman, I mean, right. That's, that's the classic point. Like John, John and Darcy said, you know, yeah, we get lots of these patients referred to us, you know, but then, you know, when, you know, after they have a sleep study or an HST that shows an AHI of eight, as you said, you know, you know, the co conventional wisdom, they should be on treatment. Uh, but, you know, I think these studies raise, raise that to question. So, so I, I noticed the, that the left atrial size was the same. What, what would be awesome to know, be, because my, one of my, you know, there's, at least in stroke, one of the big things I always look for in the echo is how big and baggy is your left atrium? So when your atrium gets stretched to the point that it has, it, it, it can't do anything anymore and, and uh, everything's disrupted, the real issue is, is there anything that can be done to make your AFib go away other than, you know, a procedure? Uh, so, so I guess my question is, is there some merit to treating sleep apnea earlier in patients with AFib to prevent as many morphological changes as possible? I really don't know the answer. That's why I'm asking. I just, I have no idea. That's a great point, John. And Vidya, I have to ask the question, of course, that we always ask. We keep having all these negative cardiovascular studies in sleep medicine, really nicely designed RCTs. And then, um, <laughs> and then we just get the negative ending uh, to the story. I'm wondering, of course, in this story, do we have any compliance data? This is always the question. Uh, there was not compliance data, but like I said, they did um, have that washout period where they made sure the patients were tolerating the CPAP um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for some period of time. So they, sure. <clears throat> it was restricted in those patients that they included in the study in that way. Tolerated for one week. I think it's uh, something like one that. Week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be great to to know if they were actually yeah. using it during in that Kaplan-Meier curve over time. But it's it's um, it boggles my mind that we continue to have these RCTs and there's no compliance data. But maybe it just bothers me. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I'm unique care. I mean, it 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 reflects the real work, right? I mean, you know, this is the criticism these studies get these RCTs. But you know, at the end of the day, right? compared to taking a pill one time a day, which even if you're tracking that, uh, you know, often is like 50% compliance. Um, this is a therapy you have to use for eight hours. And, you know, the reality is even with run-in periods and all of this, uh, you know, you're, you're lucky if you sort of can get up to four to five hours, like save was only, a, you know, a, three hours or so, um, you know, but at, unfortunately it's, it's the real world effect. And, uh, you know, you're right. It'd be lovely to know what happens if they're on it for seven to eight hours a night, you know, but even in SAVE, when they, when they did that, um, when they looked at at least post hoc analyses for longer adherence, they, they, they didn't see, they didn't see improvements, you know, but, you know, you can argue about sort of post hoc analyses and those things. Sure. Sure. Gosh, I love this discussion because you're going to, Sally, then you're going to love this next study. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, next one is the impact of positive airway pressure therapy adherence on outcomes in patients with OSA and COPD uh, overlap syndrome. Um, so this one specifically looked at the adherence to positive airway pressure in these patients. So um, these patients with overlap syndrome have a high morbidity and mortality and there's a paucity of data on outcomes of um, the use of positive airway pressure in these patients. So um, this study uh, posed the research question of what are the effects of positive airway pressure on health outcomes, resource usage, and costs in patients with overlap syndrome. It was a retrospective study, um, observational, but with adjudicated claims data. Um, this study was performed in the US. It was linked to objective data with um, usage uh, of positive airway pressure from their devices. And they used propensity scores to match patients who were adherent and non-adherent to positive airway pressure. And the outcomes determination was uh, 
the health outcomes for severe uh, COPD exacerbation and the resource usage included doctor visits, ER visits, hospitalizations, um, equipment and supplies and proxy costs to these uh, resource usage. So they um, identified close uh, 6,800 patients overall. Um, and in the propensity matching, they identified 712 patients in both the adherent and non-adherent group. They found on average, uh, the age was about 60 years old. Um, the sex of the patients was um, slightly female, but a relatively even match. Uh, the payer distribution was um, mostly Medicaid than Medicare um, in the matched groups that were used, but pretty evenly distributed overall in the overall population. Um, home O2 use was about a quarter of the patients and uh, tobacco use, which they didn't identify whether active or former, but former uh, in the COPD population was probably most of them. So I think this was active was um, slightly lower in the PAP adherent group than the non-adherent group, which was not one of the propensity factors. Um, the study was well-matched in terms of comorbidities like coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, asthma, pneumonia, depression, anxiety, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and GERD. Um, but they did report more psychotic disorders in the non-adherent positive airway pressure group, about 14% versus 8% in the PAP adherent group. And this was uh, the interesting part of this study is that in the matched Group. So blue is the unmatched non-adherent group, uh, orange is the matched adherent group, and the gray is the matched non-adherent group. Um, in the year before positive airway pressure, in the matched group, there wasn't much difference between um, adherent and non-adherent, but after um, one or two years of PAP usage, you see a significant reduction reduction in the mean ER visits in the patients who are adherent to positive airway pressure versus not. Uh, similarly, hospitalizations were relatively equal in the year before usage of positive airway pressure in the matched adherent and non-adherent groups. And by one and two years, there was a significant reduction in hospitalizations. There was not a decrease um, in the other outcomes that were looked at. They did have a fair amount of missing uh, data. So missing covariates um, that may have contributed to healthcare utilization was not included in the study. Um, it used CMS claims database, um, which did not include Medicare fee-for-service patients. Um, and the study, um, because of the uh, population that was uh, observed, they, they had more females in the study, which um, I think was a, a nice change. It compares adherent to non-adherent group, but they didn't really look at a dose response for the uh, amount of adherence. They used the definition um, of CMS for at least four hours for 70% of the nights in 90-day um, intervals. And then uh, this may have a healthy user bias in that the adherence patients were also the ones who um, tended to smoke, have be less uh, often active smokers, um, less likely to have those psych psychiatric disorders, and they may have other characteristics that contribute to their general health. But I thought this was a pretty um, convincing study that positive airway pressure therapy uh, is probably associated with a reduction in ER visits and hospitalizations, but not necessarily doctor visits and patients with overlap syndrome. Um, and expect to see more additional prospective studies and studies with more patient-related outcomes um, for these patients with overlap syndrome. So, um, yeah, I was pretty excited about the study and wanted to get your thoughts. Save the best for last, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Have to end you know, with a positive, right? That's right. 
Yeah, one one thing I was thinking of, gosh, this ties in nicely with your COVID study, the very first one you presented, right? Because that was more hospitalizations and you wonder about those mechanisms. And here you are having, showing some type of mechanism with um, usage of CPAP, uh, whether that decreases airway inflammation, et cetera, and avoids hospitalization. That's, you know, sort of a discussion point, but uh, I wonder that that would tie in nicely with your first uh, study. I'm actually, other I'm the, other comment, the other comment is uh, you, you've come a long way because women COPD has been the fastest rising group. So they, this was a retrospective database and they found a lot of women, which is what you're going to find in that group. It's uh, at least more women than we used to. So the other thing would be that I, uh, I, you know, that they, they sort of had a diagnosis of COPD in prospective studies. We'll probably look at severity, hyperinflation, tolerance, adherence, and all those things we think about that uh, limit uh, that. How did they define adherence? Uh, yeah, like I said, they used the CMS criteria and they looked at 90 day intervals for okay. each of the right. two so years. They had, down, they had downloads and all that. So yes. that's good. So, um, I, so I missed that. I missed that if you. I missed that if you said it. But probably that's. I, I think I did, but I'll make sure to stress that. But yeah. yeah, I'm in the step down unit now, and I'm not letting anybody get discharged without their, without their BiPAP when they leave <laughs> from this study. So, and we'd like to know how you do that on another visit. <laughs> that. A lot of people are staying a long time is all I can say. <laughs> um, yeah, and so those were the four studies that I was really going to highlight. And I said four and a half that I was going to present because this is just a quick editorial um, from the European Respiratory Journal by just Stowe and colleagues, um, just to address the uh, Phillips Respironics recall of their uh, PAP devices and the cancer risk and adherent users of polyurethane foam containing CPAP devices. Um, this is, like I said, just an editorial um, that they presented some data from June of 2021. Recall um, after that, they looked at a clinic based multi center cohort that linked health administrative data, such um, to identify new onset cancer. Um, these patients that they included were diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea from 2007 and 2018 who were on CPAP for at least one year. They excluded patients who had a diagnosis of cancer before or in the first year of CPAP use. Um, they identified uh, close to 4,500 patients of which uh, 1648 were treated with Philips Respironics specific devices that were recalled. There was no increased risk of cancer in the patients who used Philips Respironics versus non-Philips Respironics devices. And there was no increased cancer risk based on the number of hours that they used their devices or the number of years that they were using the devices. Um, so, you know, as we uh, navigate our way through the recall and helping our patients, the data that was presented in this article, uh, this editorial really showed that there was a low risk for cancer in patients who are using the CPAP devices with polyurethane foam. Um, and though the slow recall process, this is just um, some additional information to maybe talk to the patients about the risk benefit ratio of continuing to use their PAP therapy while they're waiting for their recall devices to be exchanged. And that was really my, the the articles I wanted to present. I'll tell you my uh, two runners up <laughs> papers that I had, uh, uh, I prepared um, and I won't have time to do all of these. This one was an interesting one. Uh, Tatiana Kinzerska and her colleagues uh, actually looked at air pollution on a daily basis and the effectiveness of positive airway pressure therapy in individuals with sleep apnea. 
It was a retrospective community-based study and one of the first to show that air pollution and environmental factors uh, potentially cause day-to-day -day, um, differences in obstructive sleep apnea severity as indicated by the adequacy of PAP therapy. Um, their research question was, do short-term changes in outdoor air pollution adversely impact adults with OSA using PAP therapy? Um, I didn't find the, the figures. Yeah, this was the, the major figure to show um, differences in the change in apnea by ozone, nitric oxide, salt, um, and other uh, air pollutants. But the change in the apnea hypopnea index was so small <laughs> that I uh, didn't feel it like it was clinically significant. Um, the other study that I was looking at was uh, about hypoglossal nerve stimulation on um, its reported long-term patient reported outcomes compared to using positive airway pressure devices. And this study did report that 12 month um, patient reported outcomes were similar to three months of PAP therapy. Um, however, there's, I thought the limitations of the study also in terms of comparing um, the group that was actually using PAP therapy to the group that was referred for hypoglossal nerve stimulation really are not comparable groups. Um, and for the reasons that they're uh, referred to hypoglossal nerve stimulation in the first place. So um, again, less compelling results, but it was um, satisfying to know that the hypoglossal nerve stimulation did have um, persistent improvements in patient-related outcomes like sleepiness, the FOSQ insomnia severity index, and the PHQ-9 for depression, as well at the 12-month mark after uh, nerve stimulation implant. So, yeah. Those were my runners up. Good. Thank you for listening to that.